Um, I want to start first with the campaign that you are part of at the moment. Uh, hashtag we are done talking, hashtag tell your truth. A very, very, very um, insightful uh, video that you tweeted uh, this past weekend. And let's just watch that video first before we get to chat to you. My name is Lebu Mashile and I am a survivor. This particular incident occurred in 2002 when I was 23 years old in the hotel room of a guy who I'd been dating for a little while. I trusted him. I didn't think that he would harm me. I said no repeatedly and he did not listen. I didn't press charges. I didn't tell anybody for a year. He went on to have a flourishing career in media and broadcasting. He's very well known and very well respected. To date, he has not faced any consequences for what he did to me. All right, Leba, so you're one of many, many women who are telling their stories, who are done talking, who are telling their truth. What do you hope to achieve with this campaign? We hope to create a survivor archive um, because we have we have this uh, very problematic uh, contradiction where many many women, many queer men, uh, many vulnerable people in our society are expressing that they have experienced various forms of gender-based violence and violation, and there are no perpetrators magically. You know, um, and we're also now experiencing this uh, particularly cruel phenomenon of men using the justice system to uh, institute defamation, charges of defamation against women who are telling the truth about their experiences. So this is in response to, to that, you know, to the fact that the justice system is failing women, the fact that the police system is failing women. Um, and we're at a, an interesting moment where something has shifted in the zeitgeist, particularly on social media. Um, many women have come forward sharing their stories, and women are believing other women. Um, and I think this is what really threatens threatens many perpetrators and many patriarchs is the fact that now, for the, the first time, you know, um, at least on social media, when a woman comes forward and says that this is her experience, very few people uh, negate her. And there's, an, uh, there's a, a groundswell of women who are able to embrace her and, and support and believe her. Um, and that's quite ground, groundbreaking. Well, Lebo, you know, there, there, there will obviously be some skeptics out there now that you speak of the justice system who say, why did you not report this at the time? Uh, uh, you know, this, this was nearly 20 years ago. Why didn't you report it? And, and, and you speak of uh, for nearly a year, this person getting away with it. What happened after a year then? Um, so I didn't report it, you know, in the moment as it was happening. This man was, he was a broadcaster. Um, he was much further in his career and in his life than I was. I, in, and in the moment when it was happening, I was conscious of the fact that if I run out of this hotel room and I go down to reception and I call the police or, you know, I ask them to call a cab for me, uh, this is what is going to define me and what is going to define my career. I'm going to spend the rest of my career being the woman who was raped by so-and-so. And it's, I, I mean, it's, it's quite scary when I think about the fact that I was very conscious of that, and I made the decision to not do it in that moment for that reason. And I kept quiet for a year out of shame, out of guilt. I blamed myself. I blamed myself for being in his hotel room. I blamed myself for trusting him. But, you know, and it took me a while to, to understand and a lot of reading and a lot of processing to understand that making the decision, consenting to spend time with him alone in his room was not me consenting to have sex with him, you know? Um, after a year, I told people in my life who were close to me, I haven't pressed charges because the justice system, the police, also re-traumatize women. Um, there are women who have come forward with the, with the incidents of abuse that they've experienced years after, you know, with uh, trying to uh, press charges against their perpetrators. And, I mean, the police come with rape kids looking for physical evidence of uh, what happened six years ago. You're not going to find that. So our, our criminal justice system is failing massively to address this issue. And it doesn't, um, it doesn't take into consideration that it takes time for people to be able to process trauma. You know, if I was going to deal with this using the criminal justice system, I would have had to go to the police immediately when the act had happened. I didn't have the support system or the 
the resources or the emotional or psychological wherewithal at the time to be able to do that. And I'm at peace with the fact that, you know, I'm, I'll probably never expose this person. I'll never name him. But my story is mine. No one can take that away from me. No woman deserves to be charged with defamation for telling the truth about her life. Certainly given uh, a lot of women, I suppose, the guts, if I were to say, to go out and, and do this, even though you don't have to name the person, but to say, you know who you are, and I'm telling my story and my truth. So how much of this level actually drove you to, to, to what you did, to your experience, to, to, to getting into Sarah Bartman's story? How much of you is in that? How much of this experience is in that as well? So many of my experiences are in the piece that I wrote about Saraki's life. Um, and in many ways, if I didn't have Saraki's life as a reference point to understand a lot of the experiences of gender-based violence that I have uh, endured um, as a working woman, as, as, a, as in relationships, in personal relationships, I wouldn't have been able to make sense of many of the things that have happened to me. Saraki is a woman who experienced harrowing violation, degradation, violence. But when we look at her experiences, of being displayed, of having her body being ridiculed, of sexual violence, of sex work, we see that there are threads that connect her life 200 years ago to contemporary life, you know? Um, so I mean, Sarki helped me to understand why, as a plus-size woman, I received so much backlash for being on television, for being highly visible. She helped me understand why experiences of trauma that particularly Black women experience often get erased, you know? Um, th there are so many ways in which Sarki has helped me to make sense of my own experience. Um, and, and I feel like her... Her life is a kind of threshold for modernity that black women kind of have to pass through in order to understand why we experience the things that we go through right now. Um, and in the piece, I mean, we've used uh, time in a really interesting way. You know, we try, we've try, we tried to collapse time as much as possible to show that the experiences that Saki went through are as valid and as true and as present, you know, in 2020 as they were in, in 1820. Well, how, how, how does one go on? with all of this because you continue to inspire you continue to be so brave about all of this how do you go on having been a, a, a survivor of sexual assault having been a victim of body shaming how do you do it and let's be honest we can't put that one on men only because it's women who do it to women when it comes to body shaming and harming our own body image for sure. I mean, of course. I mean, you know, the the the, the argument that women are also um, agents of patriarchy or supporters of misogyny, definitely, it's true. We are conditioned to be agents of patriarchy. We are conditioned to hate ourselves. We're conditioned to hate and compete with other women. We're conditioned to judge other women as much as we're conditioned to judge ourselves. But even the most patriarchal woman is also being abused by a patriarchal system. And that's what we must acknowledge, that you can be a person perpetrator and be a victim at the exact same time. What's helped me to understand this is, is a lot of um, feminist work, you know, feminist writings, feminist artists, um, having an incredible support system of, of friends and family members and uh, critical thinkers, you know, who are working through these ideas in their own life and in their own work. Um, also just, you know, with healing tools, I mean, therapy, um, you know, uh, exercise, creating new relationships with my body seeing my body through my own eyes, through the lens of my own experience has also helped me tremendously. And I'm always looking for new tools to put into my healing arsenal, you know? Um, this campaign is not intended to force people who are not ready to tell their stories to tell their stories. There's many ways that you can support the campaign. You can support it by watching the videos or by sharing the videos or by recording other people who are ready to tell their stories. You don't have to reveal your face. You don't have to reveal your name. You don't have to reveal the name of your perpetrator. And if you even, if you're so triggered that you're not even ready to do that, that is okay, because being a survivor is a complex, layered experience. It's not one-dimensional. There's not one way of responding. If you are not brave enough to share your story today, that's okay. One day, maybe you will be. Oh, thank you so much, Debo Mashile. We need more women like you, and there are many, many like you out there as well. Thanks so much for sharing all of that with us.